Hey, good evening. Uh, I apologize that we are not together this evening at the church building, uh, but weather and cold temperatures have prevented that. But I am glad we have the opportunity to record uh, a lesson uh, for uh, you tonight, uh, and hopefully it will be a blessing. Uh, it won't be as long as if we had discussion, uh, and I will miss discussion about that. If you want to be turning in your Bibles, we're going to be primarily in the Gospel of Mark, uh, bouncing around a little bit, but looking at a particular topic. Uh, so if you want to turn to Mark chapter 8, uh, we'll read our first passage in Mark 8, uh, 27 through 30. Mark 8, 27 through 30. Uh, I'll be reading from the revised edition of the New American Standard Bible, but whatever translation you choose uh, will be perfectly fat. Uh, our topic is going to be who do you say that Jesus is? Uh, and we're going to look primarily back uh, in the New Testament as who did people say that Jesus was uh, when he was here uh, on this earth. And in doing so, we're going to look and learn a little bit uh, about some things that may help us uh, as interpreters of the New Testament, a little bit of background, especially about Elijah uh, and, and about the concept of a prophet coming. Uh, and then we want to think about how can we relate who Jesus who people envisioned Jesus being uh, 2,000 years ago? And then who do you say that Jesus is to you today? Uh, and who can Jesus be to uh, the audience we're trying to reach uh, with the gospel? Because I think you'll find, as far as the Gentile audience especially, uh, and to some extent Jewish Jesus' opponents uh, in his day, that many people view Jesus uh, or don't have a need for Jesus in our society today. I will apologize in advance. I'm coming off the backside of a cold, uh, and so I may have to pause and clear my throat, uh, maybe take a drink of water. So I know that's kind of rude, but uh, I don't have any choice uh, in doing that. So uh, we'll finish up by kind of a practical application of that uh, in our lesson. Uh, but I want to go back and think about how things were when Jesus was here. And so in reading from Mark chapter 8, uh, verses 27 through 30, says, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered him, them not to tell anyone about uh, him at all. And so, who did people in Jesus' day say that he was? And, and people were probably very confused uh, because Jesus didn't advertise himself as the Messiah uh, or the Son of God. He often referred to him as the Son of Man, really more times than he ever refers to himself as the Son of God. Uh, and even his own disciples were confused about necessarily who he was, except when we look at Peter's response. And we'll dig into that and unpack that a little bit more later on uh, in the lesson. Uh, but people were wondering, who is this guy? Uh, as we see, the opinions did vary. Some people thought he was John the Baptist, who had been killed by Herod Antipas, and we'll talk about that in a second, too. Uh, Elijah uh, was someone uh, who had died a long time ago, over nine centuries earlier, nearly nine centuries earlier. Elijah had been taken up into uh, the heavens in a whirlwind, so he didn't die a physical death. Uh, he was taken uh, by God, but a long, long time ago. Uh, and also, all the Old Testament prophets had been dead for at least 400 years by the time this was occurring. So every opinion here that was given to Jesus in this conversation about who he was involves someone who would, would have to have returned supernaturally, uh, have to come back from the, the dead, he, even John the Baptist, because uh, we see over in Mark 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, Herod Antipas was afraid because people were beginning to say uh, that Jesus was John the Baptist, had come back from the dead, and he was sweating that a little bit because he had had John the Baptist uh, killed, uh, and he was kind of upset about that. But then again, in Mark 6, we see further testimony that people also thought, well, maybe he's Elijah, or maybe he's one uh, of the prophets of old uh, that heard, had returned. Now, Jesus says uh, about his description, or the description of him given by his opponents, uh, Jesus' own testimony says that they weren't very generous, or as generous in thinking he was Elijah, or John the Baptist, or or one of the Old Testament prophets, they certainly were not going to acknowledge uh, any of that about Jesus because they, they were trying to discredit him. Uh, but Jesus says he was accused of being a glutton, uh, a drunkard, uh, and probably most famously a friend of tax collectors and sinners, uh, which Jesus was. 
uh, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He recruited a tax collector to be one of his disciples in Matthew. Now, uh, he went to the house of a tax collector, Zacchaeus, uh, in that famous story from Luke's account. Uh, and he was known because he said, I'm not here to help the well people. I'm here because a physician is comes to help the people who are sick. Uh, and the tax collectors and sinners are the ones who needed him. And so that accusation was true, but one that was certainly derogatory uh, in nature by Jesus' enemies. And so let's think a little bit about uh, the two primary thoughts that people had about Jesus, uh, that being Elijah. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, I know when I think our Tuesday latest class is, is studying about Elijah. Uh, I've been thought, I've thought lately about doing a lesson about Elijah and Elisha. Those two major prophets uh, that we know a lot about uh, in the narrative of the Old Testament. We don't know a lot about uh, the narrative, at least the background of a lot of the prophets. And Jeremiah might be an exception to that. Uh, but we know a lot about Elijah and Elisha, and we don't talk about it very much. And so I, I think I'm glad our latest class is looking at that. I probably need to do a regular lesson on that. Maybe we do that uh, on Wednesday night in the spring. Uh, but we will look at Elijah, uh, first of all, because it's very important. If we look at uh, the Gospels, we see Elijah uh, involved in this conversation. Uh, and also we want to talk a little bit about well, why is the coming of Elijah mentioned or, or was even thought about in looking at that. So Elijah's primary background uh, is in the narrative of 1 Kings 17 uh, through 2 Kings 2. Now keep in mind our division between 1 and 2 Kings uh, is arbitrary uh, and done later. Uh, because uh, the book of the Kings and the book of Samuel, for example, and the book of the Chronicles uh, were all thought to be one scroll, uh, one book originally. So we do have kind of a break there right in the middle of the Elijah story. If it was if it was not arbitrary, some people think the scroll was getting too big, <clears throat> whatever that may be. But it's been in place for a, a, a good amount of time. Uh, but he is a protagonist. Uh, he's a, a, a going against uh, his antagonist. Uh, primarily King Ahab of Samaria, uh, or Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, and his queen, the Phoenician princess Jezebel. Uh, often say in class, Jezebel never committed adultery, but she sure, that seems to be the name that any southern woman uses to refer to a woman who is maybe promiscuous uh, in that way. But her primary issue, and the primary issue with her, is she has promoted in Israel uh, the worship of the storm god Baal, uh, and is is leading Israel astray. Now, King Ahab was actually politically and militarily a good king, uh, an effective military leader, uh, and I think at times had had doubts about what was going on and maybe really kind of felt bad about Elijah in some ways, but did not like Elijah running his mouth, and Jezebel uh, certainly uh, did not uh, like that. The most famous story, uh, probably many of you may know, uh, and you may not, if so, if you don't know, I invite you to go read it, is in 1 Kings 18 where we see Elijah uh, has gone through a period of discouragement uh, and thinking everybody's out to get him. God encourages him by saying, hey, there's a lot of people that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, uh, and I need you to get moving uh, and go back and take the message. And there's a confrontation, a challenge, throwing down the gauntlet, per se, uh, by Elijah to the prophets of Baal uh, on the uh, hilltop confrontation on Mount Carmel uh, near the Jezreel Valley, a very famous one. Uh, where they build altars, and, and Elijah kind of makes fun of Baal that he's not coming down to light his altar up, uh, and they put water all over the one to God, uh, and Yahweh blows that altar to pieces. So it's a decisive victory and a convincing victory and a, a dooming victory uh, as far as the prophets of Baal, uh, but a victory for Yahweh and, and for uh, Elijah. There is certainly some messianic association with Elijah. Not that he's the Messiah, but that he would be a forerunner of, uh, of the Messiah. Now, I don't necessarily want you to have to turn uh, to this, uh, but I'm going to uh, read uh, a little bit uh, from Mark chapter 9. If you want to flip over there, we're just about a chapter away in your reading. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 9 through 13. Then I'm going to flip over to Malachi chapter 4 and Malachi chapter 3. Like I said, you don't necessarily have to turn to those, uh, but if you want to, you can read along uh, or write this down and go back to them. But I will read the verses aloud. So reading in Mark chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 9. Uh, this is after the Mount of Transfiguration, where we'll talk about here in just a minute. As they were coming down the mountain, uh, speaking of Jesus, he ordered them to tell no one about what they'd seen, which is an often, often something Jesus warns people about, and they don't do it, uh, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, 
Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is coming for, is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as is written about him. So Jesus uh, uh, indicates that Elijah has come. Uh, and in some messianic expectations, and they're based out of Malachi 4 that we'll read in just a minute, uh, is that Elijah would come first and pave the way for the Messiah, for the great and terrible day uh, of the Lord. There's a, it, it could be a whole other lesson talking about the particular days of the Lord, because uh, there's more than one. Uh, it, but generally, they're a day of God's uh, intervention into human history, perhaps of judgment or of massive change. Uh, we think about sometimes in Christian eschatology or thinking about last things, the day of the Lord being the final day in human history, uh, a day of a judgment day or things along those lines. Uh, but we look at the basis for what Jesus had to say, and, and the, the, the disciples were correct. The scribes were indicating this, but they weren't making that up out of some tradition. Uh, they were using their interpretation or talking about their interpretation of Malachi chapter 4. And we think about Malachi 4, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 for you right now. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. That day, the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, and the son of righteousness shall rise. That's S-U-N, son. The son of righteousness shall rise. And healing with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Now, also over in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, we see a verse that reminds us about some of the things that were said about uh, John the Baptist. It says, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, uh, says the Lord of hosts. So there is an anticipation of a messianic forerunner. Uh, and so, and, and we'll see that Jesus explains when he says to his disciples in the verse we just read that Elijah has already come, speaking that that's already taken place. Uh, obviously, the scribes did not recognize that, uh, and, and probably nobody did. Uh, but Jesus explains to us a little bit about that. But there's this expectation of some forerunner uh, uh, coming before the Messiah. Uh, and once again, we'll talk here just a little bit about, okay, what was the expectation of Messiah? And that's even a misnomer by me to say the expectation. I should say correctly, what are some of the expectations uh, of a Messiah? When Jesus told his disciples, as we read in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 13, Elijah had already cut. Uh, and this is more clearly explained in Matthew 11, uh, verses 11 through 15, uh, and chapter 17 of Matthew, verses 10 through 13. If you want to go read that later, uh, it's again Matthew 11, uh, verses 11 through 15, and Matthew 11, excuse me, 17, 10 through 13, saying that he had come, and he had come in the form of John the Baptist. Now, this is a little bit of a challenge uh, because uh, John himself testified that he was neither Elijah nor the prophet foretold by Moses. Uh, and John says that in uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 21. Obviously, I'm talking about John the Baptist in the Gospel of John, uh, saying that uh, because he wasn't, Elijah in the flesh, nor was he the prophet that Moses foretold in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, but most scholars think that Jesus was clearly referring to this coming of Elijah symbolically or, or figuratively or maybe metaphorically, whatever the best way to describe that, uh, in the form of John, meaning this guy had come to pave the way, the messenger had been sent, uh, and this prophecy of Malachi apparently was fulfilled in the person and work uh, of John the Baptist and the mission of, of, of John the Baptist, who was a very revolutionary person. Uh, and certainly, if you want to read his story, he condemns the behavior of the Jewish religious aristocracy uh, and their behavior uh, that they're going through. And so he's 
not the hill. He calls them a brood of vipers when they come and approach him and says they need to repent. Uh, John came with a very strange teaching, uh, baptized, uh, a baptism uh, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, of which we really have trouble finding a forerunner of that. Uh, we, uh, Brian and I addressed that quite a bit uh, in uh, an upcoming podcast that we have on baptism. Uh, there really is no forerunner uh, for John's baptism. Proselyte baptism uh, into Judaism came much later. Uh, so John had a strange and unusual message, certainly did, but he knew he was preparing the way uh, for the Lord's Messiah. John knew that absolutely, and he recognized Jesus as the Messiah when he baptized him. Uh, now, later on, it seems he had second thoughts because he sent his messengers to Jesus and said, hey, uh, I'm paraphrasing, yeah, you know, I want to be sure that you're the guy. You know, And Jesus responded to him and said, hey, you go tell him that the lepers are healed, the blind receive their sight, uh, the poor are taken care of, uh, and, and all these things that were supposed to be, uh, we see in Isaiah and also the Dead Sea Scrolls, the anticipation of that. Uh, he certainly stirred up, John did, stirred up a lot of fervor with the people uh, as this strongest opponent, and he was extremely popular. Uh, I'm reminded uh, in Mark chapter 11 when Jesus' opponents come to him and say, hey, what authority by, you, you tell us what authority you have to do these things or where your authority comes from. And Jesus, as he often does, stumps them by saying, well, I'll tell you what, you answer my question, I'll answer yours. Where did John's baptism come from, from heaven or from man? And of course, you know, they huddle up and they say, ah, we can't say that it came from heaven because we denied John the Baptist and we discredited John the Baptist. And we can't say it came from man because the people will go nuts uh, because he's very popular. So we, we see indicates they turn around to Jesus and say, if we can't answer your question, Jesus says, well, I'm not going to answer your question either. But we see from that indicated John's very popular. We think about even in uh, Acts, uh, in subsequent New Testament books, uh, that Apollos was a disciple of John, and, and Apollos was way up in Ephesus and then went to work in Corinth. Uh, and so I think John's teachings went way beyond just a secluded area in the southern part of Palestine. Uh, but he did not fulfill many of the messianic expectations. He didn't usher in some utopian world. Uh, he didn't rise up in rebellion against the Romans. As far as I know, John wasn't a healer or one who casted out demons uh, or who restored the sight of the blind or worked many of those things that people may have been expecting uh, of a Messiah. Another thing we see uh, about, uh, but he, we do know that Jesus says he was essentially John, Elijah uh, in coming. The other thing we see about Elijah, where people are like, man, Elijah sure is popular in the New Testament, uh, is you know, the Mount of Transfiguration that we see in Mark chapter 9, Matthew chapter 17, Luke chapter 9. All the synoptics cover this event. John's gospel does not. Uh, is Elijah is right there with Moses and Jesus. Now, Moses is the greatest prophet Israel ever knew prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, he was it. He brought the most important thing. He was a deliverer of God's Torah, his teachings and instructions to uh, his people. We see how much he's revered in the New Testament uh, because the law of Moses. We are disciples of Moses, the Jesus, the uh, uh, Jewish religious establishment uh, would claim uh, in doing that. But Elijah's right there amongst some of the most important people. And of course, in Jesus uh, being extremely important. So and, and the disciples don't act like it's any big deal. You know, they say, let's put up a tabernacle or a tent for each one of these guys and uh, Elijah's there right in the midst uh, of those things. And then as we think about when Jesus cried out on the cross, quoting from the Psalms, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, in Aramaic, his first words sounded like, to the audience at least, he was crying out for Elijah uh, uh, on the cross. And so again, there's this like association with Elijah uh, that was very popular. Now, it would have to be a study I haven't done to see just how extensive within the Messianic framework of Second Temple Judaism, uh, the period that Jesus lived in, uh, how popular that was. Uh, but it certainly is very much associated uh, with the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so we think about the next thing that he's uh, talked about being is a prophet, uh, a prophet returning from old. I'm not sure exactly uh, how many prophets were expected to come back to life. I haven't studied that. Uh, but one of the things we got to remember, we, we often associate the word prophet with a future teller not a fortune teller, but a future teller, that prophets only came and said, hey, here's what's going to happen. But we really think about a prophet, and uh, the word in Hebrew and the word in Greek, very similar meanings, is they're a messenger, uh, an envoy of God bringing a message uh, of God. And that's what they did. And if you read through the Old Testament prophets, there are many different things that they did. 
Uh, often they warned Israel about their sinful state, uh, whether it's idolatry, neglecting the poor and the fatherless, uh, or even just some warnings about like Haggai and Malachi, but like, hey, you've gotten back from, you've been restored from Babylon and you've built your houses back. My house still lay in ruins. Uh, when are you going to rebuild my temple? Uh, uh, warning uh, about, you know, just how they're gone astray and all that they're doing. They've neglected God. They've neglected the worship of God or they've polluted the worship of God by synchronizing it with the worship of other gods uh, that don't exist. Uh, and warning them, you need to repent, you need to change, uh, or else the wrath of God is coming upon you. Uh, Jeremiah, there's a lot of parallels between the work of Jeremiah, the work of Jesus, especially the reception of Jeremiah by the Jewish uh, religious leaders, uh, that and there's no way God's going to knock his temple down. Are you kidding me? God would never allow that. God would never allow his holy city to be destroyed. Jeremiah is like, yeah, he will if you don't repent. Uh, and, and, you know, Jeremiah was persecuted because of that, thrown in a hole because of that, nearly killed. Uh, so a lot of parallels with, with Jesus. But by definition, Jesus was a prophet. He was a uh, emissary of God, sent by God for a purpose and had a message from God uh, for people, a, a greater message than all the previous Old Testament prophets. But it was a message of repentance and said, you need to straighten out. He was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, you have to be in a state of being lost in order to need somebody to lead you back uh, in looking at that. And so also Jesus was a prophet foretold by Moses, as I mentioned earlier, in Deuteronomy 18, uh, that he was someone who God's will send, Moses said, God's will send a prophet greater than me uh, later on. Now, once again, that was something maybe they were looking for because they asked John the Baptist, are you the prophet? Uh, and I think they were asking him, are you the prophet foretold by Moses? Uh, that was coming. So by definition, Jesus was a prophet, but not a resurrected prophet of old. Uh, Jesus was not by any means uh, somebody from the Old Testament had been brought back to life. Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, it had existed prior to the creation of this entire universe, and according to John chapter 1, was the agent of creation uh, of our universe. So let's finish up our lesson. That gives you a little bit more New Testament background and maybe help you in your New Testament studies. But let's think about Peter's response. Uh, that we read in Mark chapter 9 in verse 29. He says, uh, some translations uh, you, uh, would render this Christ, some translations Messiah. When Jesus says, who do people say, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up, because Peter's always pretty quick to speak up, sometimes not in the right way. You are the Christ. You are the Christos, uh, he says uh, in Greek. Uh, and in Greek, Christos is the uh, equivalent Greek word uh, to the Hebrew term, uh, we often uh, transliterate Messiah. Uh, and the anointed one is what that means in both Greek uh, and Hebrew. You are the anointed one. And boy, that's a lot to unpack when Peter makes that statement. Uh, you know, who else, what does that mean that you're the anointed one? We can also recollect Martha uh, when we're reading about the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11, uh, that Martha acknowledges, you know, you are the Christ. Uh, you're the son of God. And so, and obviously amongst Jesus' followers, people begin to believe that he is the Messiah. But what does that mean? What does that mean to Martha? What does it mean to Peter? What did it mean to the other disciples? Maybe the disciples weren't even uniform in their own understanding of what Jesus was going to do. Now, Jesus had told them time and time again, and they didn't listen very well, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be captured, and I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to rise, I'm going to raise, rise from the dead on the third day multiple times talking about they still didn't understand that and they still freaked out when he was crucified uh and, and didn't know what to do uh peter even to the point of denying even knowing who jesus was uh did it but i still think they had this expectation that jesus might overthrow the religious leadership he might rebel against the romans because you know peter brought a sword to the garden of Gethsemane the night that jesus was arrested he was armed uh, maybe they're expecting some kind of trouble. Maybe they're expecting what Jesus was going to do. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, everybody's laying the palm branches down in front of him. Hosanna, David, King David. Those are probably the same people saying crucify him just a few days later. Uh, doing it. So everybody had different expectations, and there were different expectations about a Messiah. Uh, it's interesting in Matthew's account, he adds to Peter's response some, some words that are not included in Mark's account. And so I'm going to read this. This is in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, and you don't have to turn there right now, but you can turn later. In Matthew 16, 
verses 17 through 19, after Peter makes this response, you are the Christ, says, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then it goes on to say, and Jesus said, don't, don't tell anybody about this, uh, the, or, or tell people that I'm the Christ. Uh, now, you imagine you're Peter, and you hear what Jesus just said back to you, and you're probably, your mouth has dropped. Whoa, that's a lot of things that Peter don't understand, doesn't understand, or did not understand at the time about building his church and his keys and all this thing. That's a whole other study. But except, think about how amazing it'd be to hear that, how heavy uh, that would be to hear that. And then Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Uh, a lot of scholars think when Jesus told people not to tell things that he did was he didn't really want some messianic fervor to get stirred up too far ahead of when it needed to be uh, or for people to try to force him to be something he wasn't uh, in, in being the Messiah. Jesus did not go around bragging about being the Messiah, but because of his great wisdom and God's great wisdom, there was a certain time that that needed to be revealed to the general populace. But obviously Peter has been given that gift of revelation not by his own, uh, by deducing it on his own, uh, but because God has given it to him. His Father in heaven uh, has given it to him. And so how awesome uh, is that? I don't know what that would feel like. And so we think, what did this declaration mean? Uh, that depends on what Jew you asked, uh, whether you asked some of the Jews in Palestine, whether you asked a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a Zealot or an Essene uh, or the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which some think may be the Essenes, but we haven't proved that. They have different expectations. Uh, of that, uh, or you're a Jew that lived in the diaspora, meaning you lived outside of Palestine, whether you lived in Rome or you lived in Corinth or you lived in Alexandria, Egypt, or you lived in Antioch and Syria, wherever that wound up being, uh, or you lived in Galatia, you may have different expectations because you don't, you didn't maybe work born in or lived in a land that you wanted delivered uh, from the Romans or have any expectations like that. So some people think Jesus was, the Messiah was going to be uh, a deliverer. Uh, of the people, that he was going to be a Davidic warrior king that was going to overthrow uh, the Roman hegemony or the uh, oppression of Israel and, and restore God's land to his people. Uh, the author, of the, authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, describe a coming individual as a teacher of righteousness that would be opposed to the wicked priest, meaning uh, metaphorically the religious establishment in Jerusalem that the Essenes thought were, had misled everybody and were promoting evil things. Uh, much along the lines of John the Baptist. Some people think John the Baptist may have been uh, part of the sect at Qumran, but we don't know that for uh, uh, for sure. Or that the Messiah was going to restore, uh, as this warrior king, this Solomon-like kingdom of Israel, where all their enemies were at bay, the land was bountiful, their enemies cowered before them, uh, they had all their territory back, they were at peace, they were economic superpower. Uh, blessed of God, their, their children were born healthy, their animals reproduced, their crops flourished, you know, that kind of expectation. I don't think anybody expected what actually happened and what Jesus came uh, to be. And so as we think about how are we going to deal with that today, the Gentiles in Jesus' day had no anticipation of a Messiah. Uh, nobody that was a Gentile in Rome or anywhere throughout the Greek world, the Greek, Greek and Roman world, was looking for a Messiah. Uh, they had a Lord. Uh, and a savior, the Greek words kurios uh, and soter. They use these exact terms uh, to describe Caesar in Rome because it was Caesar, the, the man of the people, the represent, the, he was called the principal citizen. Uh, actually, the, the Roman emperor is never called an emperor uh, in Latin, uh, but he was the first citizen. So he was a man of the people. And when the people needed bread in times of challenge, Caesar provided bread. Caesar provided the circuses and the entertainment. Caesar was the guy who took care of everything for the people. Uh, he was their Lord and Savior. Uh, his, these descriptions are recorded about him, uh, even sometimes on coinage uh, about him. So they weren't looking for a Messiah to deliver them from their enemy because they didn't need deliverance uh, from that. Now, certainly there were people throughout the Roman Empire that rebelled against the Romans and things like that, but they weren't looking for uh, a Messiah. And we think about that today. That's the parallel I wanted to make in finishing up here is what, what, what about today? Is the general population of this planet uh, looking for a prophesied Messiah? Uh, no, they're not. 
Are they looking for someone to save them from the consequences of their sins? I don't know. I don't think so, uh, because we think there's a lack of belief uh, in Yahweh or the God of the Bible, Jesus, or, or the Bible as uh, the Word of God uh, amongst about 5 billion people on this earth. Now, if we assume that about 2.4 billion people claim to be adherents to Christianity, one has to assume they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, and they believe in the Bible. Uh, so I'm using those as round terms. But we're about 5 or 6 billion people maybe that don't. Uh, have any acknowledgement of that or don't believe in that. Uh, there are lots that may believe in the God of Abraham uh, and, and call him Allah in the Islamic religion. Uh, we have Jews, which are not a large segment of the world's population that believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus, uh, and they don't believe uh, that the Bible is the authoritative word of God and, and, it, and it contains what we need for salvation uh, amongst all those people. Uh, and I even think about it in the Christianized world. Uh, right now, we have, we support, this congregation supports missionaries in France. I want you to digest that a little bit. France would have been the seat of Christianity uh, or a very, very massive seat of Christianity in the medieval ages. Uh, Notre Dame Cathedral was probably the most prestigious Christian building in all the planet. Uh, but yet, especially post-World War II, when that population experienced what they thought could be so horrible that there could be no God that would allow war, something this country does not understand, uh, because it hasn't been bombed to oblivion like the European cities had been in the, in the 1940s uh, and the horrible atrocities of war we haven't seen uh, is there can't be a God uh, or the Word of God has become so corrupt. Uh, and so a lot of people in Europe have begun to walk away from Christianity uh, and people in America are the same way. In our country, we're, we're the same way. And a lack of belief in God is getting down to where it's just 60 or 70 percent uh, people in this country believe in the Bible uh, and believe in God uh, and in Jesus' message. And so we're, we're working towards being the Gentiles of the Greco-Roman world. Uh, but there are people still looking for deliverance. Uh, I think they do so foolishly uh, by looking to politicians uh, to deliver them, and that's pretty futile and foolish. Uh, also, maybe medical innovations or maybe cult leaders that rise up and tell people a message uh, that they want to hear. I recently watched a very informative documentary on David Koresh. Uh, his last name is the Hebrew term for Cyrus the Great, the anointed one that, that Isaiah calls the anointed one of God. Uh, he changed his name to David to be King David and then the Messiah. Uh, that wasn't his birthday. But the people that followed him, and he was, he wouldn't use the Bible. Uh, but people look for that. A lot of people are desperate for that. And so I think about what people are looking for today. If they're not looking for a prophesied Messiah, well, I wrote down some things. I think that based on what I know from ministry uh, and, and know from the other people that I work with in ministry who are really, really, really good at listening to these things, is that people are looking for deliverance from struggles. They're looking for safety. They're looking for stability. They're looking for refuge uh, from this very violent and, and, and misbegotten world we live in. They're looking for a close group of connections who will not betray them and who will support them in times of need. I think people are looking for encouragement, empathy, and sympathy. I think they're looking for opportunities to help others. A lot of people in this world want to have an opportunity uh, to be benevolent towards other people. Uh, they're probably looking for relief from a burden of a seemingly fruitless and pointless life. You know, what am I live for? What am I here for? What am I doing? And I think they're looking for arms to hug them uh, and souls to love them versus a world of anger and hate. And so... This is what we know we get from what Jesus gave us in the church uh, and gave us through his sacrifice on the cross and through his resurrection, that hope, that point and objective in life uh, to, to live uh, according to his will and his words and his example. And so how do we convince them of our belief of who Jesus is, who we describe him as, who we promote him as, uh, the provider of all these things? I think we do so by being real, by eliminating hypocrisy. Uh, by acting like Jesus did, by acting in compassion, by acting in mercy, by, act, by, by showing pity, uh, by showing love. Uh, and the upcoming 10 months in our country are going to be a swamp of bitterness, anger, rhetoric, and division that's going to run rampant uh, up until this time of election. I can't think of a time in my 50 years on this earth where there's been a more divisive time uh, in American history, uh, I didn't know I was not alive during the Vietnam War. Many people, uh, my parents' age, would say that was a time uh, that was very divisive in our country. 
you know, I can't even fathom spitting on a soldier like people of that generation did. Uh, neither can my, my daughter. That's just so foreign. But we see a time of division where, where war and conflict did not bring us together uh, like maybe it did. But let me tell you that the people who are looking for these things that I described that Jesus could give to them, the poor, the widows, also the poor, the widows, the orphans, the hungry, and the hurting, they're still going to be here the next 10 months, and they're still going to need our help. The kingdom work that Jesus gave us to do, including evangelizing others and bringing them to know him as their Lord and Savior uh, and baptizing them for the forgiveness of their sins and helping them walk uh, in newness of life, that work's been going on far before this little blip in human history we call the United States. And if the Lord permits time, it'll go on long after this little blip in history uh, is over. So let's be focused on showing people who we think Jesus is, who we know. Uh, that Jesus is. There is plenty to keep us busy uh, and, and keep us away from, from getting involved in nonsense and things that are pointless and things that are, be honest with you, quite temporary uh, and quite worldly uh, in thinking about this. So I want to close uh, with Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 20 through 25. Uh, I'm going to read that to you. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. This is Paul's words to the church at Ephesus. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not see it. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Those who steal must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor, doing good work with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up, as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, and this is the closure, as God in Christ has forgiven you. So as we think about all the things that Jesus was said to be in the New Testament era, he he wasn't Elijah. He was the prophet to come, but he did not come and fulfill those messianic expectations uh, as some warrior king, but he came as a warrior for God and a warrior for the people who were in need and the people who were hurting, uh, and as a warrior for us who needed forgiveness from our sins as a provider to reconcile the gap that was placed between God and humankind by the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. He came to join that back together. Uh, and let's promote that. Let's promote all those things. Instead of bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice, let's be kind to one another. Let's be tenderhearted and forgive one another, just like Jesus Christ taught us when he was here, because that's who Jesus is. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, be with you tonight, even though it's uh, not in person. I pray that God will bless you all with safety uh, and with warmth and that we won't have bad weather on Thursday. And I do want to close us in a word of prayer, if you'll bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day and the sunshine outside. Uh, we've been doing some rough weather, Father, but I'm thankful that uh, we can see your creation at work and your mighty power and how we can be humbled uh, by the creation around us and sometimes rendered powerless, and sometimes we need that to humble us. We pray, Father, that the weather this Thursday evening will not be severe, uh, and we pray for melting of the snow and so that all of our members who want to uh, and our guest uh, can join with us Sunday to worship you Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Uh, we pray that you will uh, continue to bless the leadership of this congregation, uh, that you'll give our elders wisdom, uh, that you'll be with all our workers here in this congregation who are trying to help other people uh, and to show the world who Jesus is and to share uh, Jesus' mercy and kindness and compassion uh, with one another. And thank you so much for the mighty blessings we have uh, out there. Let us be considered of those who don't live in warm houses that have warm meals to eat uh, as this season uh, continues. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see all of you Sunday.